Good morning, Redeemer. What a beautiful day the Lord has given us to worship Him today. I think we've had a pretty beautiful week thus far, and as the seasons change, so our circumstances change as well. We've had our first uh, in-person fellowship this Friday, um, and it really was a blessing, a delight to just be able to fellowship in person, and there's something, you know, different about being there with each other, sharing each other's lives, and uh, being there physically. And so it was a blessing, and I think I was reminded that we constantly seek a sense of normalcy. And really, when we think about all the changes that are going around us, we can really cling to our God who never changes. His constant grace is for us. He is constantly uh, merciful to us. And he's all-powerful, all-knowing. And it, and it is this God who we come to worship this morning. And so I hope and pray that uh, we will be reminded of the God we worship even in our call to worship now. So let's all rise from where we are and hear the call to worship, which comes from Isaiah 55, 6 through 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen. Our God, who is far higher than anything we can comprehend, compassionately calls us to his throne this morning. And so let's all pray, asking that he would richly bless our worship. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you indeed are the sovereign Lord over all creation. You who transcend even the heavens above have shown us grace and mercy in your Son, the Lord Jesus. Who are we that we can partake of heavenly worship? Who are we that you would condescend to us and watch over our souls? Thank you for being both a sovereign and compassionate God. And we pray that you would direct our desires and affections this morning to you by your Holy Spirit. Give us eyes of faith and ears to hear of how wonderful and awesome you are. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and the perfect work of your Son. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, good morning, Redeemer. Would you rise as we respond and worship today? It's your breath in our lungs. 
So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You. Great are you, Lord.
all be seated. As always, we come and confess our faith together as the body of Christ, and today we'll be taking a look at the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question number three, where we address uh, where we can find uh, everything we, do, we need to know about God and how we ought to live for Him. And so as we recite this truth, uh, may we be reminded of the importance of the Scriptures. I'll read the question, so please respond by reading the answer. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. In response to our confession of faith, we'll be singing the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, though Satan should buffet. Though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, know oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. O oh Lord, haste the day 
When the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trumps shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. my soul it is well it is well with my soul amen as we have read in the shorter catechism the word of god the bible uh, really does teach us uh, all the things we ought to believe concerning god but it also informs us and instructs us on how we ought to live for him for his glory but how often do we merely depend on our own judgments and our own discernments we're often led by our own fears our our doubts our anxieties and our emotions when the scriptures instruct us to live courageously in the lord we cower back in fear often and perhaps this is because in the deepest crevices of our hearts we have unbelief of who God is and uh, what he has given to us in Christ. So as we come to confess our sins before the Lord, let's think about where we might have some unbelief in our hearts. But at the same time, may we all find confidence in him to live courageously in this life, knowing that we have nothing to fear in the Lord Jesus because he's the one who's leading us. Let's pray in confession of our sins. The scriptures promise that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, if you have placed your hope in the righteousness of Christ alone, you are saved from all your sins. May this hope empower you now to live unto Christ with thanksgiving and courage. Amen. Let's all rise as we bring our tithes and offerings. God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above ye heavenly hosts, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. You may be seated. Let's all pray together. Father in heaven, we give you praise and thanksgiving for all that you have done for us. In your death and resurrection alone do we place our hopes, and this truth is what gives us power to live for you. Please remind us daily of your saving work by your Holy Spirit, and give us strength in times of doubt, fear, and uncertainty. We come before you with supplications, knowing that you hear every one of our cries. So we pray for all those who feel discouraged by current circumstances. With COVID and sociopolitical tensions, many feel hopeless for our society. Yet you have shown your faithfulness time after time in our own lives. Thank you for providing an abundance of vaccines in America and giving us a sense of security. We continue to pray that you would be with the whole world and their struggles with COVID and grant healing and hope by your common grace. We also continue to pray for our missionaries who continue to face trial and difficulty in these broken parts of the world. Although they do not have the luxury to get vaccinated, continue to help Pastor Damon and Pastor Tim to be a source of light to the people they serve. Use them as examples of Christ's steadfast love for them and give them gospel encouragement from those around them. 
We know you are doing a work far beyond our comprehension. So continue to gather your sheep into your kingdom by your Holy Spirit, O Lord. We also pray for our children and youth that you would help them not to be complacent in their faith or the responsibilities that you have given them. Please help them to continue growing in their faith and give them a greater capacity to love you with heart, soul, mind, and strength. As we come before the preaching of your word now, give us attentive ears to hear of your wondrous grace. Please give Pastor James the words of gospel encouragement that we all need. May your Holy Spirit lead Pastor James to speak and lead us to receive by faith the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. I hope and pray that all of you are doing well. Um, it's funny because while we're live streaming and uh, we're singing the hymn, it might have got a little distorted because of the volume of our mic. But I don't think it was the volume. I think Yuma was just singing loud uh, because I think all of us were just singing with so much passion. Uh, that hymn is absolutely powerful. I was uh, telling the people here that um, I changed the hymn literally last night. Uh, as I was just thinking about today, and I thought about, you know, just that hymn came to my mind, and I was singing it all night last night, uh, to the point where Sela asked me, Dad, is that your favorite hymn? Because I just could not get it out of my head, um, indeed, in every way. And I pray that uh, that hymn will truly resonate with you today, especially as we think about the narrative that we're about to hear today, that you can say, that no matter what life may bring, that it is well with my soul. And can you even say that even at this moment, that it is well with my soul? <clears throat> you know, for all of you on live stream, um, I'm so grateful for all of you. I know that it cannot be easy. I can't forget what Roman once said, Pastor James, we do see you. You know, you make it sound like we don't. But I do know you that, Roman. I know, Roman Grant, that everyone that's online, that you do see us. And I want you to know that it means a great deal to us, even though we cannot see you, um, that knowing that you are joining us for worship. And as our brother was sharing today on Friday at our, at our home group, uh, we decided to meet in person outdoors. And it was such a wonderful blessing um, just to gather, laugh, and it was such a beautiful day. We could not ask for a better day. And we looked for, it gave us a taste of what we are looking forward to in the future indeed. Today... I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles as we're going to look at Mark chapter 4, verses 29 through 34. Mark, Mark 4, verses 29. <clears throat> and this is the reading of God's holy and precious word. May you pay close attention to it. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Amen. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. <clears throat> when I was a kid, I remember one of my favorite songs uh, as a kid was, With Christ in My Vessel. Um, and the reason why I love that song was because it was always, you had to, they, they, would just, they would mess around because as the song would go on, you would take a word out of the song, right? And so we would sing, with Christ in my vessel, I can smile at the storm, smile at the storm, smile at the storm. With Christ in my vessel, I can smile at the storm until he leads me home. And then sailing, sailing home, sailing, you know, and go on, right? And it was just fun, right? You would always take out a word, right? They got to take out the word vessel, with Christ in my, I can smile at the storm, smile, you know, and would take out word after word itself. And it was so much fun. But I realize even more as I get older how true that kid's song is in our life. That with Christ in my vessel, I can smile at the storm 
until he leads me home. But even though the song is true, I wonder how many of us truly believe it. Can you really smile at the storm? Not because you have given up, not because you have just simply said, you know, what's the use, but because of the fact that you know that Christ is with you in the midst of the storm. This past Tuesday, we received some good news in LA County that we finally hit the yellow tier marker. And hopefully by this Tuesday, we will actually be in the yellow tier. And because we're in the yellow tier, it means that restaurants, businesses, and churches can now have more people indoor as the capacity has been raised. It means ultimately that things are get or getting better, maybe by June 15th, that we will finally get rid of all restrictions here in LA County. And there is hope. But even though there is hope, and even though there is good news, people are still afraid. I know this even in our school district, that even though people are vaccinated, even though the numbers are getting better, people are still afraid. We're still afraid of COVID. Kid, people are afraid to send their kids back to school full time. They're still afraid to go to restaurants indoors. They're afraid to go to church indoors. They're afraid to get together with their friends. And their fears are real. This is what really is hindering for many people. And the reason why is the pandemic has traumatized so many people. It has affected us more than we could imagine. Because people have lost their loved ones. They have seen family members pass away or friends pass away as a result of COVID. They have seen businesses go bankrupt. They have, seen, they have experienced hard, severe hardships and illnesses. And they're afraid that perhaps they will have to endure it again. This pandemic has caused so much anxiety and fear. And that's why when we think of the pandemic, we think of a key word, panic, right? Pandemic, panic, it seems like they go hand in hand because that's exactly what people have experienced. And the fear is real. And so often when we think about the nature of fear, we always think fear is to be a negative emotion, something that is destructive or bad. And I think it is in the long term. It can affect you spiritually, emotionally, physically, if you live by fear all the days of your life. But at the same time, fear can be a gift. It's a gift because so often when we have fear, it signals to us that we are in danger, right? You don't have fear unless there is some kind of danger that is ultimately around. And so in that sense, fear is a good thing. It becomes a warning signal as well. At the same time, I also believe that fear can be a teacher. It teaches us as well. It teaches us what we value. It teaches us what we believe. It teaches us perhaps the things that are inside of our hearts and inside of our minds. You see, Paul Tripp says that fear is an interpretation of life right? It's an interpretation of life. Why? What do we do in life? We look at a situation, and we look at our ability to deal with a situation, and therefore either you will have hope, right, when you assess your situation and your ability, or you will have fear. If you can handle it, then there's hope. If you cannot handle it, there is fear. And as Christians, we add another element to this. We add God to the picture. And again, right, you have your situation, you have your assessment whether or not you're able to handle that situation. As Christians, we have God. And so therefore, either you have hope or fear. But here's the thing. As Christians, we assess the situation, we assess our ability, and we have God. And yet, why is it that we still have fear? Perhaps because of the fact it's our understanding of who God is. Right? If your idea of God is small, right? that you feel like he cannot help you, and that's why you still have fear, even though you may be a Christian. And that's why I love what our hymn says, that you have taught us to say, it is well with my soul. We have to be taught to say this, and the reason why so often, it's so hard for us to believe it. We only see with our physical eyes, but yet we do not see with the eyes of faith. And we have to be taught to say, it is well with my soul. Because it does not come naturally. And the way that we are taught this is that we have to learn to see God bigger. We have to see God bigger in our lives. Not simply know that God is bigger, but believe that God is bigger than we can dare hope or imagine. You see, perhaps this morning, that's why you are afraid. 
You're going through a hardship. You are facing a storm where you are overwhelmed and afraid. You assess your situation. You feel like you cannot happen, handle it. But I ask you, where is God in that picture? Who is God in that picture? And that's why this morning I pray that as we go through this narrative that you will see the magnitude and the glory of who God is and who Jesus is. You see, we just read a very familiar story where Jesus, after a long day of teaching and ministry, tells his disciples that he wanted to go to the other side of the lake. He wanted to leave the crowd behind. And I love this. It reminds me of the humanity of who Christ is as well. And as they're going across this lake, they encounter a severe storm. It's not an ordinary storm. As a matter of fact, the Greek word can be translated almost like a hurricane. And you can imagine how severe the storm is because who is afraid? It's the disciples. And remember, the disciples were experienced fishermen. So they're used to storms. They are used to hardships on the water. And yet, if they are terrified, it must mean that this must have not been any ordinary storm. The waves are rising. They're crashing into the boat. The boat is filling up with water. And they know that it is not good. And what do they do? They begin to panic. And they feel overwhelmed. They cannot control the situation. No matter what they did, it did not help. The water is still rising. They feel like it is hopeless. And to their credit, they realize that maybe Jesus can help. They turn to Jesus. But what makes it worse is not only the physical situation and the circumstances, but Jesus is sleeping in the middle of the storm. Right? Here is this outrageous storm, and he's absolutely sleeping. Right? We know people like that, right? It doesn't matter what's going on. They'll be out like a log, right? Like sometimes Sora, when she sleeps, she could be out like a log. Nothing wakes her up except for the alarm clock, right? It, but it could be an earthquake. It could be whatever. She is out like a log. All right, here we see Jesus is sleeping. It's not because he is out like a log. It's because he knows that nothing will happen outside of God's will. He's at peace. He is calm even in the midst of the storm. The chaos does not bother him. It does not awaken him. He is at peace. And they ask the question, how could he be sleeping at a time like this? And perhaps you understand their fear. You understand their panic. Why? Because there are things in your life where you feel helpless and hopeless, where you feel like you too are drowning, that you cannot control your situation. You try to understand it, and you feel like you are absolutely drowning especially maybe in the midst of this pandemic. Maybe it's the fear of the unknown. Maybe it's the fear of not being able to stop the virus. Maybe it's the fear of what our lives look like after this virus is all over or what will happen to our children. What does their future look like? Perhaps there's some financial troubles. Maybe there's some relationship troubles and you feel like you are drowning. No matter what you do, you assess the situation and you assess, you assess, you assess, assess your ability to deal with it and you feel like you cannot change anything. And what's even worse, it seems like God is so far away, that God is so silent, as if he is sleeping. And so what did the disciples do? They awake him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we are perishing? You see, the way this can be translated is not simply a question. But they're accusing him that he does not care. It basically can be translated as, you don't care that we are perishing. If you cared, you wouldn't be sleeping. If you cared, you would do something to help us. And it is clear that the storm is creating another storm in their hearts. Or perhaps the storm that they're going through is telling them something about who they are and what they ultimately believe. Because here they question the care and the very love of God, right? And we understand that too. When we go through a hardship and we feel like we're drowning, what do we cry out? We say, God, are you there? God, do you see my situation? God, do you really care? Because if you care, God, then why aren't you sparing me from this? God, why aren't you saving me from this tragedy? Why are you making me go through this? God, where are you? And therefore, we conclude that maybe God is you are putting me through this because you don't care or you don't have the ability to get me through this. But perhaps this is why Christ led them through the storm. To teach them of who he really is. 
to show them that maybe that he is more than a teacher. Because they say teacher. Right? They call him teacher, but they fail to realize that he is the Lord. They don't forget, he is the one who said, let us go across the other, other side of the lake. He knew what he was about to encounter. And he was at peace. Why? Because he is the Lord. And so often we question that in our lives. And God is using the storm to teach them of who they are ultimately who he is. You see, God brings us through the storms of life that we may witness God's mercy, kindness, justice, love, wisdom, and power so that we would know him. You see, this is the matter of what is life. This is the matter of life and death. But yet you see what happens in the midst of this crisis. Christ does more than they can imagine. Because you see, when they ask him, why aren't you doing anything? What do you think they were expecting Christ to do? Maybe they wanted Christ to get a bucket and pour out more water, have another man to help out. Maybe they Christ to help, expected Christ to help steer the boat back to the shore, right? But I guarantee you the last thing they thought that Christ would be able to do is what he did, right? That's what I would have thought if I was a disciple. Help us get the water out of the boat. Help us steer the sh ship back to shore. But what he does is absolutely amazing. What he does shows that he cares. You see, even though the storm cannot awaken him, what wakes him up is his disciples. He hears their cry. He knows them. And Christ is still calm. And seeing their fear, fear what does he do? He rises up and he rebukes the wind and the sea and says, peace, be still. And the winds wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He does not speak to disciples at this moment, saying, where is your faith? Don't you know who I am? No, rather than rebuking the disciples, he rebukes the waves. And at that moment, the wind ceased, and the water is calm. This is absolutely amazing. It's one thing for the wind to be stopped, but to make the waters calm after the storm shows his power. And the one who was at peace in the midst of the storm, is the one who brings peace to the storm. You see, he uses two works in Greek, literally that says, shut your mouth and keep it shut to the storm. Like a master to his dog, he speaks to the storm, and the waves immediately are silent, and everything is calm. You see, this is who Jesus is. He is the Lord of creation. He is the one who has all power. He is the one who's brought all things into existence. He does more than simply help. He brings order to the chaos. He does more than they could ever hope or imagine. That is his power. That is his glory. It is that power that he's able to turn chaos into order. Yeah, he could have prevented them from coming. He knew exactly what was coming. And he could have made them avoid this situation, but he doesn't. Because he wants to show them who he is. He wants them to know that he is in control. Or the disciples feel like they are helpless. That he can change their circumstances even though they cannot. All he needs to do is simply speak. You see, they called him teacher. And they are right. But through this storm that he shows them that he is the Lord. This is the one who is with you. This is the one who goes with you in the midst of your trials and hardships. The one who has this power. The one who's able to do immeasurably more than we can ever imagine or ask, my dear friends. You're not alone. This is why we can say, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should prophet, though trials shall come, we still can say, it is well with my soul. Now Christ, could have, we could have ended the narrative here to show you the power of who Jesus is. Right? The story could have ended here. But I think that Mark wants to show us more. He wants to show us our hearts. This is why Christ says to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? You can only imagine their reaction. What do you mean, why were we so afraid? We thought we were going to die. But Christ goes on to ask, have you no faith? In other words, he's saying, where is your faith? Because you see, fear and faith are not compatible, right? If you have fear, 
It means that your faith is misplaced. And if you have faith, then you will not have fear. You will say, it is well with my soul. You see, the problem for the disciples, they were afraid because they had the wrong presuppositions. They had the wrong idea. For them, they concluded, if God loves me, then he wouldn't bring me into the storm. If God loves me, he would protect me from the storm. If God loves me, my life should be perfect. Nothing shall go wrong in my life. My life will be easy. My life will be fantastic. But going through the storm, Christ is telling them, no, your faith is misunderstood. That I will bring you to the storm, not because I hate you, because I love you. There's a reason that I bring you to the storm that you may not understand, but it's through the storm that I will shape and make you by showing you who I am and by strengthening your faith. You see, for the disciples, Christ existed for their own comfort, their security, and their prosperity. For them, their life revolved around them. Christ was existed for them. It was all about them. They wanted Christ to give them whatever they believe will bring them happiness, whatever will bring them security, whatever will bring them prosperity. And as soon as they don't get it, what do they do? They question God's love and care. Why wouldn't you give me what I want? Just like my children who can't understand why we don't let them watch cartoons all day or pay, play Valorant all day or watch YouTube all day or play League of Legends all day. No, because why? We don't hate them. We do this to love them. We create this trial for them, not because we hate them, but because we love them, because we want more out of their life than what they believe that they can get out of life by doing these things. In the same way, we're just like the disciples. As soon as we go through a storm, we question his love and grace. Why would God allow me to go through this? As if we are shocked that he would do this. But this is exactly what God does. Because through these hardships, through these trials, it is then we witness the power and the glory of who God is. It is then that our faith is strengthened and sharpened. It is then that we become stronger indeed. You see, he teaches us that through these storms that he is all that we need. That he alone is our shelter, our comfort, our everything. It is through these storms that we're reminded that he is the one who goes with us, that he's always with us, that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Because you see, when we go through the storm, what is he ultimately doing? God is saving us from ourselves. By reminding us how inadequate we are and how he is actually strong and perfect for us, that he is the Lord. That is why, my friends, is that when we have this faith in Christ, there is no reason for us to be afraid in this world, that we can be strong and we can overcome. And hearing these words, we see the response of the disciples. The Bible says that they were filled with great fear and said to one another. Now, here's a situation, right? The storm is calm. Everything is good. But the disciples are still afraid. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? But here the word for fear is different than the word for afraid. Earlier, that word of fear that they were going through is a word that can be translated as terror or panic. Right? But here, when he says to them, you know, that they were filled with great fear, the word here is a word that says reverence or in awe in the face of a powerful force. In other words, they're, they're afraid because they're like, whoa, who is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? Who is this? It's almost as if they were worshiping Jesus at this moment. That no matter how scary the storm is, this is even greater than the storm. Because they're wondering, here is the one who is able to deal with the power of the storm. Who is that that even the wind and the seas obey him? That what they were afraid of is nothing compared to the glory of the one who is standing before him. They're going to the point where they're literally almost worshiping him. Who is this? Who is this? You see, they asked a rhetorical question. Who is this? Because that is the right question. 
They know who exactly he, who he is. They realize that he is none other than God himself. For why? For who else can control the wind and the waves like this? He is simply more than a teacher. He is the Lord. He is greater than they ever could have imagined. That he is not controllable. He does not feel, fit in my little paradigms of life. But that he is beyond it. And for the first time, they're seeing him for who he truly is. And when you have this fear of God, it's this fear that will conquer all other fears. This is the fear that will be able to defeat all other fears. Because we see the one who was the ruler on high. Then what do we have to be afraid of? You see, this is why it is this fear of God that drives away all other fears. That's why the proverb says what? Fear is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If he is God, then when bad things happen to me, he allows them to happen me for my good. Even though I may not understand, because as we've heard this morning in Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He sees when our faith is rooted in him. That the fear of not being controlled, the fear of believing he does not care gets defeated. It gets driven away because we know that he is. Because he is the Lord. You see, understand that the story does not, does not mean that God promises us that we will not have storms. Or that our storms will not last a while. They will. And they will come. But what the story tells us is that, you know what? We have a far greater fear. The fear of God. Where we see the majesty and the beauty and the strength and the glory of who he is. That no matter what fears may come my way, we can say it is well with my soul. We can say that we can smile at the storm. That there is no place in the world that to be with Christ even in the midst of the storm. And how can we be sure? How can we be sure that we can, that we will say it is well with my soul. You see, the disciples thought that Christ did not care that they were perishing. But what they did not understand is that Christ came to die. Why? To give them life. You see, Christ came to give them life at the cost of his own. Because he was the one who controlled the wind and the waves. But yet he would enter the greatest storm. He is the one who would enter our greatest fear. That he is the one who would deal with the waves of sin and death. To the point where they would be so relentless and overwhelming that he would endure the eternal justice of God. Not for what he has done. Because of what we have done. That he would go and he would die upon a cross. And there will be no one to intervene. There would be no one to say, be still. No, for the wind and the waves of God's wrath would not cease until he would be swept away. Until he is the one who would perish. Because you see, it is through his death and resurrection that he would silence death and he would bring us peace with God. Isn't that why John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He died so that we may live. And if Christ entered the most fiercest storm of God's wrath, then will he not be with us even in the smaller storms of life? Will he not be with you even now, no matter what hardship you are going through? He will. And that's why we can say, it is well with my soul. And that's why, my dear friends, that's why we worship God. When we come and we say, who is this? Who is this one who casts out demons? Who is this one that raises up the dead? Who is this one who calms the sea? Who is this one who says that I am with you? He is the Lord. And he is with you.
Therefore, this morning, where is your faith? Put your faith in him. Put your faith in the one who's conquered sin and death for you. Put your faith in the one who loved you so much that he would perish so that we may have eternal life. Let us pray. And this morning, perhaps, some of you are going through some fears. There are things in your life that you're dealing with that you are feeling overwhelmed. I pray that I implore you to come before Christ. I pray that you would fix your eyes on him. That he is the Lord of the wind and the waves. He is the Lord of creation. And he is the one who is with you. And he cares. So come with your burdens. Come with your fears. And lay them down at your feet. To worship him today. And I promise you that as you worship him, your fears will begin to dissipate. That you think about the glory and the wonder of who he is. It will calm your soul today. So let us come with all of our brokenness and let us pray. Father, you ask us, why are you so afraid? Father, perhaps there are those in this live stream, in this room, where we're afraid. Afraid, Father God, that there are things in our lives that we just cannot control. That God, that we feel like we are drowning. Drowning in pain, drowning in sorrow, drowning in hopelessness. But I pray this morning that those who are feel like they're drowning, that they would know that you are with them. That the one who is the Lord of creation, the one who has all power and all glory, is the one who dwells with them, who's right beside them. And I pray that God, that they would see him for who he is. That God, that they would not see their problems being bigger, but that they would see him being bigger. That they would see the splendor and the glory of our Savior. And that they would worship him. For Father God, if the disciples were in awe by what he has done on the sea, then how much more should we be in awe? For Father God, you save us more than simply from death by the sea for you saved us from the eternal damnation of God by experiencing that damnation upon yourself so that God that we may be able to live then how much more should we be in awe how much more should we worship God let that be our heart let that be our prayer that we will stand in awe that God that when we look at our problem that God it cannot compare to the glory and the majesty of who you are so, Father God, may those who have so much fear, fear you even that much more, be in awe and admiration of who you are. So that, God, that they would find strength, courage in the midst of their pain. So we thank you for this narrative. We thank you for the hope that we have. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, now would you rise as we respond in worship?
Let's rise in thunder's roar And I will soar with you above the storm And Father, you are king over the flood And I will be soon Thank you for coming and joining us today for our worship service, and we hope that you were blessed. Um, just a couple announcements. Thank you for everyone that filled out the online survey. Um, it was very helpful, and, um, and we're going to be making some uh, uh, announcements here soon. Uh, but again, if you have not, uh, we would still love to hear from you. Uh, again, just fill out that survey. It's very helpful just so that we understand where you are at. Um, we understand your concerns, and we want to make sure that we do this in a way that will be encouraging and edifying to all of you. At the same time, next week, uh, we're beginning our new home book series um, on new, a new, ah, through a new book, uh, Living Life Backwards um, by uh, David Gibbs, uh, Gibson. And so we would love to have you join us for that time. Um, it should be a great book. Uh, it's our brothers. You must first time actually leading this, uh, this home group study. And so it should be a wonderful blessing. And we want to encourage you to come and join us for that time. And last but not least, um, our confirmation classes are over for our youth group students. And we'll be starting our interviews next week. And so hopefully we will get those done and um, we'll be able to confirm our younger students. But without further ado, may you all rise wherever you may be and may receive God's benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of the storm, and may the love of God our Father, who loves you by sending his only begotten Son to perish so that you may have everlasting life. And the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit that tells you that he is with you in the midst of the storm and will bring you to the other side. Be with you now and forevermore. Amen and amen.